Okay, so meditation three. Um, what do we want to do here? So he's, uh, he begins by setting up this, he, he wants to trace this pathway from Kanto to Russell. Um, via Frege. Um, and this hopefully is just a little bit of history that we're all more or less familiar with. More um, Contour has this really naive initial conception of set theory when, uh, when he first uh, has it. We mentioned this earlier, that, that he's almost got this kind of an ontological difference between sets and the elements of a set, right? And he's, he's trying to think it at a kind of uh, intuitive level by talking about like, the set of these chairs and so forth, right? Uh, so he's got this really naive um, conception. Uh, that launches things. And of course, Bentio has a really nice point about it, um, where he says, right, that, not that I can find it, of course. I didn't take notes in my book this time around, I should have. Uh, yeah, of course I can find it. But where he, uh, he points out that the great irony is that Contour employs all of the things that set theory is going to overturn, right? But he employs them all in his initial naive conception. Um, 38? 38? Um, let's see. Um, uh, this famous oh, philosophy, yeah. why I set what is understood as the grouping into a totality of quite distinct objects of our in intuition or our thought. Without exaggeration, Contour assembles in this definition every single concept whose decomposition is brought about by set theory. It's marvelous, huh? Yeah, the concept of totality, of object, of distinction, and that of intuition. All of them. Um, so, and the, what the result of this in, initial naive conception is that it leads to all kinds of paradoxes as people, as mathematicians, begin to work, and logicians begin to work on uh, on Cantor's initial project. Yeah, then most people actually end up just hating him. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a failure of a problem. It leads to all kinds of uh, paradoxes and the reality and so forth. Um, Frege has a kind of optimism with regard to it, and it's so crucial that Frege came along because he actually took it seriously enough to give it a new life. But, uh, but Frege has this kind of optimism that he can, uh, he can construct a totally formalized language using Kanto's basic theory. And, uh, and I mean, Betty doesn't cover this, but it's, uh, what, cruelly humorous, I suppose. Because Frege's constructing this, he's so excited, he's got the whole thing going, uh, and then he uh, gets this letter from Bertrand Russell with the paradox, with Russell's paradox we'll talk about in a moment. And Frege almost commits suicide. <laughs> over it. I mean, the term I'm looking for is shot for it. <laughs> I mean, it's just terrible. Um, yeah, he just could not grapple with the fact that his optimism was misplaced. It's just quite sad. And then he became a religious mystic. Yeah. So where else do you go? Um, <laughs> Isn't that where all failed philosophers go? <laughs> <laughs> Russell's paradox is the really crucial thing here because it's what uh, founds the way, and it's uh, Russell's paradox, incidentally, it's worth mentioning, is really in many ways the foundation of analytic philosophy. And this, uh, Frege's symbolic language is what's used, but Russell's the one that founds the entire analytic project with this paradox. Um, the classic uh, introductory logic course version of the of the of the paradox is uh, to put it in terms of the barber of Seville, right? The barber of Seville is a guy that cuts everyone's hair. Let's see, cuts everyone's hair who's do, who does not cut their own hair. Right? Did I say that right? Yeah. Yeah. So the result being that uh, there's, there's a paradox here, right? If he cuts everyone's hair who does not cut their own hair, then if he uh, who, then who cuts his hair is the question, right? Because if he cuts his hair, then he's cutting someone who cuts his own hair. He's cutting his hair. Mm -hmm. But if he doesn't cut it, then he's got to cut his own hair. This is the this is the silly childish way. Well, isn't it also so, somewhat? I mean, maybe this is crude, but the third man argument, our mm -hmm. right? So yeah. you have this set of large things. You have a form of large, which creates those. But then you have to picture that, and then what creates the large things right. in that? And so it gets in that area. So right. Yeah. So the simple way to state uh, Russell's paradox, or, or the consequence of Russell's paradox, is that there is no set of all sets. That's, that's what uh, is taught us by little formulations like the Barber of Seville, uh, is that you can't make a set of all sets. And this uh, is set, uh, that is this really nice way of putting it, right? The logical consistency of language is destroyed. That's on page 41. Um, 
No, that was manual language. It's on page 41, a few paragraphs right below, below this. Finally, we have P is an element of P implies not P is an element of P. So this equivalence of a statement and its negation annihilates the logical consistency of language. Language falls to pieces, meaning that uh, language can't hold itself together. Uh, and, uh, and the consequent, there's no set of all sets. Um, there's no whole, there's no one. And that's, that's what Russell proves. What are, what are we're still proceeding with the presupposition of the one. What are the implications on language, specifically? Uh, it's consistency falls apart. Uh, and so this is why I say you can see how all of analytic philosophy comes out of this. Wittgenstein's response to Russell is going to say, if, if, you cannot, if language can't hold consistently together, then we've got to conceive of all kinds of language games. He's got his metaphor of the city and all the different parts of the city that have been built up over time. This is how language works, right? So in the language games, eventually that gives you leotard, postmodernism, etc., right? Um, so all of analytic philosophy is following from this, this paradox that Russell formulates. And Russell built a whole career out of this paradox. It's really kind of, anyway, I'm sure he said something else important in his lifetime, but he sure got a lot of milked it for all of his work. Um, so that, I think, is the real crucial part we want to get here, right? Uh, it's just that there's no set of all sets. There's no whole. You can't gather up uh, all of the sets. Uh, that's, that's impossible because it leads to contradictions. That's the point of Russell's proof. Cantor and, and, and so on, they, they take a theological frame. They take a theological move after this and so forth, right? Um, we want to move on to. Does he make the point here that Kant's are essentially the head of that God as well? Sort yeah, of it was the only way he could hold it together. Okay. And Kant had the and, and Kant was a theologian. I mean, mm -hmm. he was a mathematical theologian for all intents and purposes. Presence versus mathematics. What's possible in Kant's name is finally to separate those two definitively, but he himself is trying to weave them together still. Yeah, it's so. Is this where the axiom of separation comes in? Yeah, in a moment. Yeah. Okay. Um, because, it, and here's the point that uh, gets us on the way. It's on page 43. We've got uh, these two requirements that issue from all of this, right? For any for for axiomatic set theory, as he says, the the real effects of the paradox. This is page 43. The real effects of the paradoxes are immediately of two orders. So a, it is necessary to abandon all hope of explicitly defining the notion of set. Since there's no set of all sets and so forth, then we cannot have a definition of set. It's got to be, uh, or, or really we should no property, right? Uh, the very idea of set cannot have a property. Because to do that is to give some kind of concession to the one, and hence to return back to the, the problem of having a set of sets. Is that not similar to the problem? Like, it's in Sophist as well, right? The, we had a stranger visitor, how your, your translation is, talks to, at a point in the dialogue, they're like, do we dare speak of that which not is? It is not, right? Because when you speak of it, you apply certain attributes to it, even though right. you don't. Which is, and again, I, again, you can see how this uh, is going to play out in analytic philosophy, right? The famous okay. last line of Wittgenstein's tractatus is, uh, where if one cannot speak, there one must be silent. Okay. And ethics of life. And hence, uh, wonderful postmodern ethics that we're all trying to return. So, um, <laughs> so then B, it is necessary to prohibit paradoxical multiples, which is to say the non-being whose ontological inconsistency has as its sign the ruin of the language. What's got to be excluded if we're going to have a, a genuinely consistent set of axioms that allow us to think the inconsistent as such, uh, is that it can't have a, what, we'll just say A and not A, right? Um, it, it can't lead, the axioms themselves can't lead to contradictions, right? And, uh, and one of those that's a direct consequence of this, and that's going to be very important for what Matthew goes on to do, marvelously important, you just can't wait, believe me, um, is that you can't have uh, A as an element of A. Nothing can be an element of itself, so this has got to be a basic presupposition of, uh, of set theoretical ontology. You cannot have something being an element of itself. It cannot belong to itself. Unless it's an event. But that's not an event. And that's where Ragdi's going to go. So, um, so this is the consequence of Russell. That's a really fast uh, jump through the first half or so of this meditation. Any points we want to make sure we deal with? Any further details?
Um, just actually, do you mind fleshing out the difference between uh, the uh, Freudian uh, language mapping and the Cantorian map or mapping? Uh, are you talking about page 45, 46? Yeah, I haven't got that far. Oh, okay. I mean, up to about page 43. Any questions on what we've done up to that point? Because that's going to get us with the axiom of separation, um, of it, which is crucial. There, he brings up, uh, he first introduces it on 39, but it's lambda as a, I don't know how to do that properly. Right. If, for example, lambda parentheses a is to formulate a uh, is natural to, is a natural polynomial. Speak of the set of whole numbers to designate the multiple of what validates this formula. This is to designate the whole numbers, uh, in other words, a set as what counts as one in a form of multiple validation. Okay. 